Hello, I'm Kate Chabot. Welcome to SITREP, your weekly look at the big issues in defence and world affairs. More than five months since Ukraine launched its counteroffensive, its gains remain modest. This fight back was meant to be pivotal in the war. This is going to go into next year and probably the year after. Over summer, Ukraine was given all the aid, it was given the money and it was given the training. And yet largely, nothing's really moved on the front line since then. As winter sweeps Ukraine, we assess if this could become a frozen conflict with the help of SITREP's Simon Newton, who's there. Mike and I will also talk to a Ukrainian political analyst and a former British infantry officer about the options ahead as President Putin tells the world he wants to talk. Military actions are always a tragedy. And of course, we must think about how to stop this tragedy. It is not Russia, but Ukraine that has publicly announced that it is withdrawing from the negotiations process. Also on SITREP, the National Cyber Force. What is it and why do we need to spend tens of millions on it? We talk to the general who's overseen its creation. As a soldier, you know, I used to go on operations, you know, once every two or three years. In cyber operations, we're working every single day of every single week through the year. You know, we're in constant contact with the enemy. SITREP with Kate Chabot and Professor Michael Clark. All wars go in phases. Uh, Mike, you've told us many times that the phase which began in June would be pivotal and it's looking like we're moving into the next phase now with no significant change visible. Yeah, that's right. We said it would would be pivotal for the nature of the war. Either Ukraine would be capable of doing what we, most of us in the West, hoped it would be able to do, or it wouldn't. And the answer is, as Richard Barons and, and Sean Bell were saying in the clip there, they've not managed it for a range of reasons. And it, the, the, the offensive is pivotal because it convinces us now, if we didn't know it before, that this is a war of attrition. It is the return of industrial warfare to Europe, as we've said many times. Uh, and we've got to take that on in the West, just as they're taking it on in Kiev at the moment. Well, before we dig into the possible military and political routes ahead, let's just get a sense of the mood in Ukraine. And SITREP's Simon Newton is in the capital, Kiev. Simon, hello. Um, it's a long okay. way from the front line, but still a city that is living with the war, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, you can, you, you can, to all intents and purposes, ostensibly it looks like a, a, a normal city. You can go out for a meal, you can shop, you can do all those things. But, you know, there's there's definitely a sense here of tension. There's been a rise in drone attacks on Kiev, the land, particularly last weekend with these Iranian drones. I think the Ukrainians down about 10 of them on the outskirts of the city. And that's what they're expecting to happen as we go into winter. They're going to try and interrupt the infrastructure. We've had our first snow here today and the temperature is now about minus three. So it's critical that these air defences keep taking those drones down. There's a, a shortfall in electricity. People have been asked to not use their electricity until this evening here, or at least to use it sparingly because of this shortfall. And um, you know, around the city, you can just see evidence that this is country at war. You, you arrive at the station, there are injured troops there. Some of them were missing limbs, and there are huge hoardings everywhere, recruiting for different brigades around the country, and, and just a sense, I guess, of, of the tension. And just yesterday, you know, we came across the funeral of, of a British man who actually died in combat somewhere in Ukraine. We had the, the British national anthem playing in the middle of Kiev yesterday, which was really, really strange. But, you know, you're never very far away from the war. And Simon, what happens when there is an airstrike warning? Well, the Ukrainians get it issued to them. They use Telegram or they use an app which has been developed like a lot of tech here by, by civilians, effectively, and it just warns you that there's something incoming. But the strange thing to us coming here is actually a lot of them don't head for the shelter because uh, you know, we were in Irpin when there was a air raid alert and they just carry on because they are, mm. they're getting so used to it. They're getting a dozen or so, if not more, of these a day or have been for some time. I think there's a feeling that the alerts are so... If something's coming out of Belarus, for instance, the alerts set off just as it's taking off. So there is quite... Yeah a long time before whatever it is reaches them and they're very mm. and they feel very confident about the, the you know the air defenses around the city um, that they now are just sort of quite quite blase is the wrong word but they are they are used to it and they just carry on and Simon the US and German defense secretaries have visited while you've been there our foreign mm. secretary David Cameron was there within days of being appointed it's a strong diplomatic showing but Ukraine doesn't have much in terms of recent progress to show in return for their support 
Yeah, I mean, it has been has been busy this week. We've had, uh, I think the Americans have pledged another $100 million or so if that gets through Congress because they're obviously having that battle. But I mean, I mean, in terms of the war, yes, there's been no major breakthrough, but I think they and we are now kind of past that moment now. The expectation has gone away that they're going to make some huge, great breakthrough because everyone understands what a difficult task it is that they're facing. They're under air attack on the front line. They're facing these deep minefields. The Russians are throwing these tactical groups after tactical groups into the fight. They're suffering huge losses. But the Ukrainians themselves, they, you know, they'd probably say otherwise. They'd point to the fact that they're managing to hold Avdivka. They're hammering the Russian forces there. And, you know, they've lost an estimated 10,000 troops there. And also, of course, we have this amphibious incursion down in the south where they've crossed the Dnieper River near Kherson, taking this foothold on the left bank and, you know, actually pushing out up to four kilometers in places. So, yes, there's no great breakthrough. And this is it's not clear whether this is the start of a breakout or just an attempt to, to pull Russian forces away from Avdivka and Bakhmut, but the Russians are struggling to contain it. So, yes, no massive breakthrough, but I think they would still say there is movement on this front line. And with the weather having turned there now, can we effectively rule out any big shifts in the military picture until spring? Well, I say we've had the first snow here last night. There's already significant snow and rain in, in the in the east of the country. Difficult conditions for the soldiers and for the kit. You know, it's hard for the armour to move. Um, we were talking to some drone pilots today. They were saying about how difficult it is with the batteries, for instance, in this very, very cold weather. Um, but I think it's very difficult to predict anything here. The war is not going to stop. The Russians are stepping up their own offensives. They're attacking infrastructure. They're hitting cities. They still have vast reserves of manpower, albeit lower quality. So I think you're probably right, but nothing is really certain. And of course, the Ukrainians can't afford to step away or pause this fight because they know the Russians will just reinforce if there is any pause in fighting. So it's a very difficult winter ahead. And do you get any sense of the mood there about the war, particularly after the commander in chief declared it to be a stalemate? Is there still the confidence and unity we saw through the first year of the war? I think the phrase, the, the translated phrase I keep hearing here is stabilisation. They talk about the front has stabilised. You know, they, this country, of course, sees itself as having been at war since 2014. So it knows what war feels like. Um, and I've read like you have probably these stories of, of gloom here in the mood, but I haven't really seen it, to be perfectly honest. I think they see it very differently from us on the outside. I asked about the Zeluzhny interview, for instance, the commander in chief. The average Ukrainians, I totally don't really take much notice of it. They're, they're similarly with Zelensky, there seems to be a general acceptance, at least from those I've spoken to, that this, you know, he is the man for the job at the moment. What you really sense here is an absolute defiance that they will not be beaten, a real hatred of Russia. And in terms of national unity, yes, there's differences of opinion, but they seem to recognise, everyone I've spoken to at least, this is an existential fight and they have to, they have to win it. And as we head into year three, what's the strategy from Ukraine's government now? Um, I think that's a very good question. I think there is an acceptance that the summer counteroffensive didn't go as planned as they would have hoped. Um, there's a sort of movement towards consolidating, rearming and preparing to go again when the time is right. That might not even be next year. That could even be the year after. Who, who knows? I mean, they have the F-16s coming next year at some point. I, I spoke to Alexander Kamishin this afternoon, who's a member of Zelensky's, President Zelensky's cabinet. He's the Minister for Strategic Industries here. And, you know, he's talking to me about what their strategy is. And, and there is a big strategy to build up their own sovereign defence sector. There's 300,000 people working in it currently. They want to make it huge and they want to basically build up their own sovereign ammunition and defence industry. They're building new ammunition factories, um, making small arms ammunition shells, for instance. So that's one of the areas definitely that they're looking at as a strategy going forward, particularly when you're looking at the prospect of, of Ukraine fatigue elsewhere in the world. And of course, the, the enemy gets a vote. Vladimir Putin mm -hmm. at a virtual G20 summit has been talking about negotiations, saying not for the first time he is ready to talk and it's Ukraine that's blocking talks. What do you think his mm -hmm. big strategy is? I think the consensus is that he's just he's happy to wait this out, you know, to, to play the long game. He hopes the West will lose interest. Ukraine fatigue, as I say, will set in. Maybe Donald Trump's elected. 
and that Ukraine will have to sort of sue for peace down the line. Moscow is pushing a third of its entire national budget into the military next year. So that's, you know, a clear indication that there's no prospect of giving up from them. Putin, and, and Vladimir Putin knows he can't afford to lose this because so he'll be happy to keep throwing men into the fight. 300,000 Russians or so have died so far, but that's not seemingly a problem. He will be reelected. We know that's going to happen. He'll make sure that happens. And there's a chance that after that mandate's issued, he'll he'll issue another general mobilization order and we will see another hundreds of thousands of Russian young men thrown into this fight. Uh, in terms of the negotiations, Zelensky has signed this decree, which he signed last October, ruling out negotiations with Russia, which is very convenient for Vladimir Putin uh, to, uh, in, in saying what he said. Uh, and of course, the Ukrainians will say there's absolutely no possibility of negotiating with Putin because they know that will mean the subjugation of Ukraine. And I guess it's easy for us to focus on the military effort. Ukraine's government's also having to maintain a functioning country. Well, that, that, that's that's very true. You know, you, that's the strange thing when you come here that this is this is a functioning country. There are other things going on besides the war. And we visited Bucha the other day, which you know people will know it's the site of this war crime. Effectively, four hundred people massacred by Russian troops. The streets have been completely rebuilt there with the help of money from U.S. charities. It's sort of unrecognisable, really. There's children in the playground, people going to work. And we also went to Irpin, if, if you remember Irpin, which is the city on the outskirts of uh, Kiev where the Ukrainians had to blow the bridge to stop the Russians reaching the, um, the, the main city. You know, that, that bridge is still there. They've left it as a monument to uh, the people who lost their lives and the 40,000, I think it was, who actually made it across. But we were actually there yesterday and they actually, on yesterday, actually opened a brand new four-lane bridge across that river, uh, you know, almost as a sign that, that things are, are moving on with life. And despite the war, they, they will keep running this country. And, and that's a, it's quite an amazing spirit to see. That was Simon Newton talking to us from Kiev on Wednesday evening. And Mike, you could almost sum up that picture that Simon paints as keep calm, carry on. But that's not a strategy, is it? Hmm. No, it, it's part of a strategy. It, incidentally, the keep calm and carry on, you know, everyone thinks of that as a Second World War um, slogan. It actually wasn't. It was devised by the Ministry of Information in the Second World War, but never used. Just the re un It was unearthed in the 1980s and it sort of struck a chord then. But there is a sort of Second World War element to this, because if you, know, you think about the Second World War for the Allies, it was defeat, defeat, defeat from 1940 to 1942. And then victory, victory, victory from autumn 1942 up to 1945. And that's undoubtedly what I think the Ukrainians are thinking about, because they do think in longer terms, as Simon was saying. And what they've got, I mean, they've, they've got some control of the western part of the Black Sea now, which gives them a, a better trade route in and out. That's important. They're within striking distance of, of putting Crimea under real pressure. That's important, too, as they think in the longer term. And one other thing that Simon was mentioning, you see, I don't think the Russians can mount another real strategic offensive until the spring of 2025. They won't be able to do very much until uh, until then, certainly not much during, 90, uh, to, during 2024. And so during next year is the best opportunity for Ukraine to have another real push at throwing them out of the, the Donbass, if they can. And I think the spring and summer next year will be a big moment for mm. Ukraine. If they've got enough to do it by then, then that would make sense. If they haven't, then the Russians will come back at them much more strongly towards the end of next year and the beginning of the year after. So what will come next? Let's bring in Maria Zolkina, a Ukrainian research fellow and political analyst from the London School of Economics and former British infantry officer Ed Arnold, now research fellow at the defence think tank Rusi. Uh, Maria, um, President Zelensky talks about difficult conditions for Ukraine's troops on the front line. General Zeluzhny was reported as describing it as a stalemate. Of course, an alternative suggested translation is deadlock. Is there a rethink going on in Kyiv? There is a rethink since the counteroffensive has started, actually, because uh, the resources which Ukrainian army has possessed at the moment when the campaign was started were far away from what was promised Ukraine would have had or should have had at that moment. For instance, the so much promised Abrams tanks to Ukraine arrived, all of them, all of them, I mean, like 31 not that much, but all of them arrived in Ukraine only uh, at the middle of October when the counteroffensive uh, was planned, uh, like as, as in a campaign where they would have been able to use that. 
But the most uh, important problem was, of course, uh, the resource which Ukraine still doesn't have. It means the air support, the support to the land forces, to infantry, to artillery, to all those mechanized brigades which were prepared uh, exactly to be used during uh, the time of counteroffensive. And yes, that's why uh, a kind of adjustment and updated assessment was made, Not is not being made now. It was already made, uh, maybe a couple of weeks after counteroffensive started. So, Ed, what military options does Ukraine have at this point? Well, I think the the first point to make, I mean, Mike just touched on it briefly, what's happened in the Black Sea and sort of shaping activity to retake Crimea, which still is the vital ground, has been significant. I mean, Ukraine have retook control of some oil platforms that were held since 2015. They now have Snake Island back. Uh, they took out a, the flagship Moscow for the last year. They've taken out a dock submarine, started to hit shipyards and dry docks, S-400 air defence systems. Uh, and the British uh, Armed Forces Minister James Heapy said that it was effectively the functional defeat of the Black Sea Fleet uh, for a military that doesn't have a navy. Uh, that is significant. And going forward, I mean, it's two things really. The key factors are of ammunition and the quality of troops. On ammunition, they need to, well, they'll need to expend a lot over the winter to keep the pressure on the Russians, but they'll also need to stockpile to support with new defensive operations. And then similarly with the trained soldiers, they'll need to manage their rotation, the needles to keep some experience in the front line, but ultimately they'll need to bring a lot of them back and start to train at higher formations to be able to try and break these lines, whether it be next summer or elsewhere. So they're the two real issues that defence planners are going to have to grip with, and it's going to be a balance of what they use over the winter and what they keep for the spring. And Mike, um, you mentioned earlier that potential window of opportunity uh, next spring for Ukraine. Is there anything yet to indicate what Ukraine's tactics might be through the winter and its strategy into 2024? Yeah, I mean, hold on through the winter, uh, certainly at Avdivka, very important that they hold on there, which I think they will, um, and see if they can nibble away and keep stretching the Russians during the winter. They need to indicate that they're not stopping fighting, and I'm sure they won't. And then for the spring, the single most important thing is to get these combined arms operations moving properly, which, as Maria was saying, is really important to base around air power. The Ukrainians have really got to try to get their F-16s and other elements of air power into integrated with the ground forces when they go again, I would guess, in the spring or early summer next year. Ed, Russia was able to very heavily build up defences over last winter. Is there anything Ukraine can do differently to stop or, or more realistically reduce that? I mean, it's going to be very difficult and it's really, I mean, I don't think they can fully prevent it, but they can mitigate it. I mean, the fighting over the last winter, I mean, it, it effectively stopped and went very static because both sides were, were fully exhausted. Um, and actually, if the weather is not conducive to sort of large scale manoeuvre, you can still sort of press on the front lines quite significantly. Things like trench digging equipment, etc., will now be much higher up on the um, Ukrainian high value target lists so where they're able to be found and struck uh, they'll start to actually strike the infrastructure that prevents Russian build ups and especially long range mining equipment which effectively fires uh, mines to be spread across a large area of the battlefield so those types of things will start to be attacked but ultimately they need to keep pressing on elements of the line and get the Russians moving, they get need to get them moving laterally so they can't sort of move back further and start to reset all of these defensive lines and that's going to be a key requirement on ammunition consumption sort of when to strike when not to strike and maria so from some quarters at least that there is a sense of a ticking clock on the western support on which ukraine relies do you think that there is a deadline that kiev is working to I wouldn't say that there is a specific deadline, but there is definitely an understanding that starting from starting from the beginning of uh, the spring 2024, the main military and financial donor of Ukraine, which is U.S., will be in a full and complete political turbulence, which is already affecting uh, the financial and military planning of supporting Ukraine. And that is why Ukraine was and actually has been working on, on doing its best to consolidate enough support among Republicans and Democrats to, to ensure that 2024 flow of aid will not so severely depend on, 
on domestic political debates. As of now, it's not that successful. Uh, but when it comes to the European Union, for instance, Ukraine sees the beginning of negotiations. Uh, but there are a number of countries which are, regardless of their membership in NATO, in European Union or anywhere else, are committed to supporting Ukraine. Uh, and I would say that those countries are um, UK, Poland, Baltic states, Uh, Mike, uh, total military victories are rare. Wars often end with some kind of talking. Do you think there is a set of military objectives that Ukraine has, which, if achieved, would put it in a strong enough position to talk? Yes. I mean, I think from a military point of view, it's not difficult to say what victory would look like. And there's two two or three different levels. I mean, what the Ukrainians say, they want all of the territory back um, that restores their 1991 borders, which are legally their borders. I mean, all of the territory that Russia has taken since 2014, which is all of the Donbass and Ukraine and uh, Crimea. And they're bound to say that. And that's fine. I would say that, too. A, A secondary version of that would be, well, all of their territory, but not Crimea. And Crimea then becomes a long term problem, which has got to be dealt with in some other way. Or a third version would be all of the territory that the Russians have taken since February last year. That would leave about a third of the Donbass under Russian control and Crimea. Now, to many in the West, that would look like victory because it would have thrown the Russians out of everything they've taken since last year. It would mean that Putin's crazy adventure has failed and that Russia has paid a huge price for it and that Crimea would be would be completely vulnerable thereafter. That would look pretty good, actually. And if the West settled for that, I think the West might then make quite big gestures towards Ukraine to try to guarantee its security on that basis. Ukraine wouldn't really like it because it would still mm. be giving up about a third of the Donbass, but the West would like it. And I think that would turn out to be the decisive factor. Ed, how military achievable would any of those options be? I think of those options, they're all achievable to a certain extent. I mean, the the one thing that would be required is a significant uplift of weapons and ammunition that's provided by the West. Uh, and as Maria says, I mean, one of the issues has been that a lot of this equipment is arriving too late to, to get it into Ukrainian hands more quickly. And I don't think politically we're there yet to sort of put more pressure on the Ukrainians to start to look at some of those options. But I think, you know, next summer and going into the winter, we might be there if they haven't been achieved. And actually, I think with it, within the talks, I mean, if you look at Zelensky's 10-point police plan, there are certain things that they could look at already. I mean, the first one is about radiation and nuclear safety. And there's also, also uh, something on uh, prisoners and deportees. So they could potentially look at that now and start to sort of build up process of dialogue there's other issues on food and energy security so sort of four of the 10 point peace plan they could start to try and make maneuvers on but when you look at the other six on territorial integrity withdrawal of Russian troops justice prevention of an escalation of conflict which includes guarantees for Ukraine and also confirmation of the war's end which would actually be very critical for UK's future NATO membership uh, there'll be absolutely no movement or common ground on those so of 10 you've got two possibles two maybes and sort of six no's um i think we're we're a long way off from any form of dialogue actually coming to any any form of resumption although the process of dialogue might begin Maria, uh, we should remember this all goes back a decade and one scenario is that this becomes a frozen conflict, no end to the war, but no movement and who controls where it ends. Is that a scenario that Ukraine might be willing to put ahead of negotiating? Ukraine is not willing to double down or to start negotiations. Basically, this is kind of consensus between, on the one hand, military elites, which understand that any kind of pause will be very short term, uh, will be temporary and will be used by Russia only to reinforce their damaged military capacities, mainly to mobilize new human resources to the army and society. On the other hand, the public opinion polls are saying that uh, 90% of Ukrainians still think that armed forces of Ukraine are capable of regaining the control over temporarily occupied territories 
and which is moreover when we are measuring the uh, willingness to compromise or acceptability of certain compromises less than five percent of ukrainians are saying that would be ready to compromise about ukrainian territories the most mm-hmm. important problem is that negotiations are not possible when the other side is not interested even in stabilization of the front line and having a ceasefire i would remind that uh, before, between 2014 and 2022 in Donbass, where I'm originally from, uh, there were numerous, like up to 100 attempts to declare a ceasefire, and none of them worked. At that time, the special monitoring mission of OEC worked on the ground on a daily basis. They reported that these attempts to establish a ceasefire was always violated by the Russia-occupied territory. So no belief that it will work when the front line is like hundreds and hundreds and thousands of kilometers now. Really good to have your thoughts. Thank you very much to all of you. Maria Zolkina, Ed Arnold, thank you so much for your time. News, discussions and analysis. This is Zitrap. Well, the attacks against Ukraine's infrastructure, things like power supplies, don't just come from air and artillery strikes. This war has demonstrated military action in the intangible domain of cyberspace can have big physical consequences. Just like Ukraine, we need to be able to defend ourselves in cyberspace and strike back. That's the job of the National Cyber Force created in 2020, bringing together defence and the intelligence services for both offensive and defensive cyber cyber operations. It's part of UK Strategic Command. Lieutenant General Tom Coppinger-Sims, who is the STRATCOM Deputy Commander, has been explaining what the force does and why. Whether it's state actors, you know, our adversaries or competitors around the world, or indeed the levels of cybercrime that are out there. And, you know, there's been a lot of speculation about, for instance, interfering with elections. And the National Cyber Force plays its part in countering those threats and limiting the freedom of our adversaries of of sort of enacting those threats and trying to do us harm, whether that's stealing our data or stealing our money or stealing our intellectual property. Can you just give me a sense of how busy you are? I mean, how great is the threats that you you outline there? Well, I think it's safe to say that um, whereas as a soldier, you know, I used to go on operations, you know, once every two, two or three years. Uh, In cyber operations, we're working every single day of every single week through the year. So we are permanently engaged. And as we used to say in the army, you know, we're in constant contact with the enemy because there's that level of um, threat and activity in cyberspace. Can you just give me a bit more of an idea of practically what that means on a day to day basis? Is is it simply a case of, of a lot of people sitting behind keyboards and monitors or is it more than that? Well, there's more people sitting behind keyboards and monitors than digging trenches in this space. That's absolutely right. Um, But within that, you know, within that invisible world, um, that domain, as we would call it, there are an awful lot of people doing a whole range of activities within that. So you will be told by your Internet provider or your phone provider once in a while that you need to upgrade your software and patch. That is a very, very significant part of online defensive work, is making sure our systems are patched, that we have the latest software available, and that means the software is working against the latest threats that we've identified online. So quite a lot of people are are doing that, facilitating that, checking that. Quite a lot of people are doing what we're doing now. So communicating with each other, making sure the threat is understood, making sure that data is shared across the world, working particularly with industry, you know, those big tech companies who really understand uh, understand the threat, that we're getting the right data from them about what the threat looks like and we're able to counter it. What are the greatest threats the UK is facing at the moment? So online, I mean, there's a huge amount of state activity um, that's directed an awful lot against America and Ukraine, but also against the UK. Um, because we're seen as a leader in this area. Um, Often that's about going after um, security data, but very often it's about going after industrial data, actually, industrial property. I think outside the strictly military sphere, of course, there's an awful lot of criminality in this space. Most people will have heard of ransomware that then locks up your data and um, they want money for that data to be released. So it's those sorts of threats uh, that we're talking about. Is there a particular one that you could tell us about without divulging too much? 
Um, well, I mean, actually, they've been pretty well covered on the op- in, in open source. I mean, one of the things that occupies a lot of our thinking in, in defense is what we saw at the start of Russia's brutal and illegal invasion of Ukraine 18 months ago, where they hacked into the Viasat um, satellite uh, system. Uh, that was really targeting Ukraine's uh, communications. But in doing so, they also took a significant amounts of uh, German agriculture and alternative energy systems offline. So that sort of ability to interfere with you know, physical infrastructure that we depend on occupies quite a lot of our, our thinking at the moment, how to protect from that and how to constrain uh, threat actors from being able to do that. And are there people trying to attack our infrastructure in the way that you described was attempted with Ukraine? Uh, Yes, I think it's fair to say that we're seeing people probing our infrastructure, our communication systems, yes, very, very regularly. And how would you explain to a serviceman or woman who may fight at the front line with equipment, sometimes decades old, that it's worth spending millions of pounds on cyber? Well, even our decades old equipment relies on either online cyberspace or it lies on the electromagnetic spectrum. And we define cyberspace as including that spectrum. So if you want your radios to work, if you want your tank to be able to speak to the tank next door, or if you want the tank to be able to speak to the artillery piece, leave alone for the army to speak to the Navy or Air Force. It's absolutely critical that we protect those systems, we protect that data, and we enable both the army, the Navy, and the Air Force to conduct their daily business because there's there's pretty much nothing we do these days that doesn't rely on cyberspace to one extent or another. And why do you think uh, we need a military force to counter these things? We have GCHQ, um, we have the National Cyber Security Centre. Uh, why do we need a military element as well, the military cyber force? Well, because we um, illegally and constitutionally, we retain the sort of use of force uh, to those people in uniform. So, you know, that's a that's a legal requirement for us as military folk to be able to wage war, if you like, on the on the nation's behalf. And, you know, that's where the partnership comes in. So what GCHQ and uh, some of the other intelligence agencies do in cyber is hugely important. But when we're supporting uh, war fighting or indeed other military activity, we need soldiers, sailors and aviators to be doing that, not least because they understand what's going on at the front line, but also because it does get to that stage of sort of military force. Can you just give me an idea of the balance and how you work out the balance between defensive and offensive in UK cyber operations? Well, I suppose like like anything in, in military operations, until you're safe, until you're secure, you don't have a basis to operate from. So inevitably defensive cyber, whilst it might be perceived by some as the less glamorous side of cyber, is hugely important. And then, of course, we need to be able to project that power through cyberspace as well uh, with partners uh, around the world, but to be able to limit the freedom of action of our adversaries and those who are trying to do us harm. Lieutenant General Tom Coppinger Sims, and he was talking to me from an event in Lancashire where the cyber force will be based in a couple of years. And we also talked about how you build and develop that force and how the keyboard warriors, as they're sometimes described, can find their place in the forces. The full interview is online now in an extra edition of the Citrep podcast. Mike, we started out talking about tank battles and minefields covered with snow, and we get to war conducted via keyboard and radio waves. They seem centuries apart, and yet uh, not not so at all. No, they're not. And as we see in Ukraine, warfare covers that whole spectrum from Starlink uh, satellites down to soldiers on the ground using their phones via Starlink to locate uh, an artillery piece a kilometre away and target it and so on. We see the full spectrum. And it's interesting the way this argument has gone, you know, because we started off, as, as General Tom was saying, I mean, you know, what he's doing with, with strategic command, recruiting sort of wonks as warriors, getting the cyber wonks in to, to, to actually act as warriors, cyber warriors. But it's gone beyond that as well, because we want cyber awareness now in all of our armed forces. We want the dexterity and the awareness amongst our troops and sailors and airmen and women actually, you know, at the front line. And in a way, for, for people of my generation, that seems quite challenging. For a modern generation, it probably isn't so challenging. And there is a word of comfort here because it's not that you've got to master the whole domain, 
But to be successful, you've got to be better than the opposition at it. That's the point. You know, nobody will mm-hmm. master this whole domain. But if you're better than the opposition, then that may turn out to be the edge that you need to win battles and wars. Mike, great to speak to you. Thank you so much for your time. And my thanks to all of our guests. That is all for now. Professor Michael Clark and I will be back with another sit rep next Thursday. For now, though, from me, Kate Chabot, thank you for listening. Bye bye. 